Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. Well, we're going to continue where we have been for the last few weeks in the book of Revelation. We've been hovering around Revelation 10 and 11. Today, we are going to move on past Revelation 11 after about a three-week period. Revelation is a Jewish book. After the departure of the church, the Lord's program turns back to Israel, and He brings judgment upon the earth. He brings the tribulation. Isaiah 13, 9, to bring an end to wickedness and the wicked. Revelation 7, 1 through 4 tells us that the tribulation period is to bring about worldwide revival. Daniel 12, 5 through 7 tells us that the tribulation is to break the power of the holy people. That is, once and for all, to convince Israel that it is the Lord that's in charge and not people. Because Israel has always taken the view that they're pretty much running things. They are very quietly accepting of the fact that they are God's chosen people, and sometimes they complain about it. Why did the Lord choose us? You know, oh, what are they? don't ever be chosen by the Lord, whatever you do. Half the time they're that way, the other half the time they are, the Lord chose us, don't tell us what to do. And yet, they never really as a nation, and particularly since their modern regathering, they have never given the Lord full credit for the blessing He has brought to them. During the tribulation, they will, and that's part of the reason, that's about a third of the reason for the great tribulation to come. We are in Revelation 12 today, and we're going to talk about the woman, the wife of Jehovah, as she is called, married to God at Mount Horeb. And the Jews liken Mount Horeb to a wedding canopy, and they liken the 613 commandments to a marriage contract. And the Jews think of themselves as the wife of Jehovah. In Revelation 12, she is seen as the woman, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. I don't know how many times we've all heard the phrase, the birth pangs of Israel, referring to modern Israel being regathered and all of the anguish and agony almost on a daily basis that Israel has gone through being referred to as the birth pangs. Well, those birth pangs are going to be quickening, and they are quickening, as we know from following the news in the Middle East, but when the tribulation comes, the birth pangs will become severe. And the wonder in heaven here is the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. The sun. Let's quickly say that we're not talking about worshiping the sun here. In fact, let's go back to Malachi. The sun in ancient Egyptian religion was Amon-Ra, or actually the correct pronunciation is Amon-Re. R-A is pronounced Re in Egyptian. And from that word comes our word, Re, as in light ray. The Egyptians worshipped the sun as the giver of life. The Greeks worshipped the sun as the giver of life. They called the sun god Apollo. But the sun mentioned here has nothing to do with those pagan gods. We have in Malachi chapter 4, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now, what is the mechanism of the burning? in the book of Revelation. We all know if we've read the book of Revelation, it's the sun. The sun goes through alternate darkenings and brightenings in Revelation, and at one point during the vile judgments, the sun becomes so bright that men are burned. The ground is 
parched to the point that nothing grows. One third of all grass is killed at a certain point in time, and the sun goes completely crazy during the tribulation. Actually, it's not the sun going crazy, it's that angel standing in the sun, regulating solar output, and during the revelation period, that sun is one of the mechanisms of God's judgment. And what is called the day that shall burn them up here is the tribulation period when the sun is heated seven times its normal brightness. He says, And the day cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And by the way, I take that literally. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. People talk about weather. Today there's a fear of the weather. There's a fear of global warming. There's a fear of giant hurricanes, typhoons, a lot of fears. There's a fear of earthquakes, a fear of all kinds of geophysical upheavals. Here we are all alone on the big blue marble, and you know, the nearest planet is 82 light years that away, and there's no way to get there. No help, right? So there's good reason to be scared if you're an atheist. If you're a Christian, you believe that God has all this under control, all the earthly systems. And the major controller of the system is the sun. Have you ever seen photographs of sunspots? Little tiny ones, you know, about the size of a pea. You could put several Earths in one of those sunspots. So let's see. You've got the sun over here and you've got the Earth over here. What is responsible for warming? Well, would it be the sun? Yes, it would. If the sun flickers, we're going to feel it. And the reason I say that is because God controls the sun. The book of Revelation talks about that explicitly. And here, the sun of righteousness, S-U-N, arises with healing in his wings. If you've ever wondered why Malachi spoke of him as the S-U-N and not the S-O-N, it's because in this context, he is controlling the ebb and flow of all Earth's energy. He arises with healing in his wings. You shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. In other words, there's coming tremendous judgments. It's going to involve geophysical upheavals. It's going to be followed by a time of blessing such as the world has not seen. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. And he is going to do it. I think we are seeing the preparation for it right now. I think the stage is being set. Malachi continues in verse 4, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with statutes and judgments. That's the marriage of Jehovah and Israel at Mount Horeb, with great ketubah, the marriage contract at the mountain. And God says, Remember, because you have forgotten. Remember. And then he says, and of course the Jews every year at Passover set a place at the table for Elijah the prophet, expecting him to come on Passover. And I think he will come on Passover, maybe this year, who knows? That is the next year in the Jewish calendar. But when he does... It's going to be a very special time. It's going to be that time after the church has departed the earth. Is Elijah here now? I don't think so. He may be. If so, he's lying low until such time as the church is taken away before things turn back to Israel and Elijah shows up, shuts down the rain for three and a half years. You talk about drought. If you remember in Revelation 10, Elijah has the power to shut up the heavens. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before, I love that word, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. In other words, hey, there's a pre-tribulational coming of Elijah. Think about that. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So you have Elijah the prophet coming. 
as one of the two witnesses. I believe that the other witness is Moses. There's a lot of conversation about that. In fact, I've gotten in a lot of trouble lately for saying the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. You wouldn't believe the foul email I have received. They want the other witness to be Enoch. But I think the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. And I always answer people by saying, you remember when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to the mountaintop and they had the transfiguration experience? Remember the two witnesses that Jesus had with him up there on the mountaintop? Who were they? Oh, Moses and Elijah. So I guess pretty much settles it for me. But what I wanted to point out here as pertaining to the woman in Revelation chapter 12 there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. She is clothed with the sun. Now, many people have pointed out, J.A. Seiss, for one, in his Gospel in the Stars, have pointed out that Virgo, the virgin, who is a picture of Israel in the heavens along the plane of the ecliptic, Virgo, the virgin, when the sun travels through Virgo and the moon occasionally arrives at her feet, it sets a certain date. The 12 stars in the crown are present as asterisms in the heavens. And a lot of people, beginning with J.A. Seiss, have said this is a reference to a pattern of stars that will be at a certain point during the Great Tribulation. I cannot say yea or nay about that. But certainly Virgo the Virgin is a picture of Israel and a picture of Mary. And we have this woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. The woman, if you go back to Genesis 37 for a moment, there's kind of an interesting note back there. And I'll take the time to turn back. Genesis 37, where Joseph dreams a dream. Verse 5, Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told unto his brethren, they hated him yet the more. Joseph was selected to be a type of the Redeemer, and in fact a Redeemer for Israel after he went to Egypt and was imprisoned. Of course, we all know the story. Joseph dreams a dream, verse 6 of Genesis 37, and he said unto them, Here I pray you the dream which I have dreamed, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. That is not a good way to get in tight with your brothers. So I'm the one. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how the brothers reacted to that. His brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him, yet the more for his dreams and his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, told his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Why only eleven? Yeah, Joseph was one of the stars, but... The important thing here is what? The important thing is that Joseph is a type of Christ. There are over 50 similarities between the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus, if you study back in Genesis. 50 great similarities. Some have said that Joseph is the key type of Christ in all the Bible. And I believe that. So going back to Revelation, and we'll be doing a lot of flipping back and forth, we might wear our Bibles out here. And mine is getting that way. But there are other Bibles. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, a moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of twelve stars. What's the moon got to do with all this? There's the sun, moon, and stars. What is the moon? The moon speaks of the Jewish lunar calendar. Did you know there are two Jewish calendars, the Hebrew calendar of the sun and the Jewish calendar of the moon? There are two different Hebrew calendars. 
It's very confusing because the two calendars do not agree with each other at all. There has been a kind of contest between these two calendars over the years. That contest is eventually going to become a solar calendar in the millennium, I believe. Don't have time to go into why, but here we have sun, moon, stars. We have time, time space. We have a predictive solar lunar pattern. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. In other words, Israel is tied to the seasons and the times in a way that only God knows. And here she is depicted in that way. But also the woman is the mother of the Lord. She being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And here in three verses we have a number of symbols all woven together. She being with child. Micah 4.9 says, Now why dost thou cry aloud, speaking to Israel, but also speaking about the Lord? Why dost thou cry aloud? Why is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail, says Micah, concerning the latter days. Micah 4.10, Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now thou shalt go forth out of the city, shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon, and there shalt thou be delivered, for the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. Birth pangs. Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 24. The birth pangs of Israel. Travail as a woman with child. Birth pangs. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great dragon. He's a red dragon, by the way having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. The dragon is a reptile, and he is worshipped all over the world. In South America, for example, before the coming of the Europeans, the Aztecs worshipped Kukul Khan, the great feathered dragon. And the Mayans worshipped Quetzalcoatl, the great feathered dragon. And both of these dragons were huge, elaborate creatures. You can see pictures of them in their petroglyphs. And these creatures flew through the heavens and did as they wished. And the people, that is the Mayan and the Aztec priests, interceding for the people, always appealed to these dragons. In the East, of course, the dragon has been long worshipped by the Chinese going back maybe as far as 5,000 years ago when we can track it. I think it's probably beyond that, but the dragon is the major power. He's the superpower, if you will. The dragon is an incarnation of the one called the serpent. And you remember back in Genesis chapter 3, and we'll look there in a minute, that the serpent was cursed. Well, those worshiping the dragon today believe that the dragon was cursed. The Chinese, in fact, if you'll talk to an average Chinese worshiper of Buddha, and by the way, in Japan, the dragon is also worshiped by certain sects. But if you talk to a Buddhist or someone who's brought up in the Eastern tradition, they will tell you that the dragon is a red dragon and that he is currently in a state of distress and he's very angry. And he flies all over the world. Occasionally he is witnessed, they say. You can see him flitting about. And going before him is a fiery disc just in front of his mouth. And the dragon is in pursuit of that disc, or sometimes it's called a pill, because once he catches it and swallows it, he will regain his lost powers. So say the Chinese. I always tell people, if you don't know about this, just go to the average Chinese restaurant where they have dragons hanging around on their light fixtures, or look at a dragon mural on the wall or a dragon calendar or whatever you can find that has a dragon, and you'll always see a little fiery disc in front of his mouth. Once you become aware of this, 
you become aware of the fact that those who worship the dragon believe that he has temporarily lost his power. That is, the great power that he used to have. And that once he regains it, there will come an era of bliss on planet Earth, courtesy of the dragon. So we have the great red dragon. He has seven heads and ten horns. We know from Daniel, for example, Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and verse 20, verse 24, where Daniel talks about the beast empire, the fourth beast empire, which has ten horns or ten kings. Three of them are deposed and replaced by the little horn, whom we believe to be the Antichrist. And so this dragon with his ten horns is a symbol of the final world empire. He has seven crowns or ruling authorities on his head, and we know that one of those is the Antichrist. Isaiah 27.1, speaking of that time, says, In that day, that is the day of the Lord, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan the piercing serpent, even Leviathan that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. The dragon in the sea is the final political and religious world system that is slain as we go on farther into Revelation. I believe in dragons. Dragons are still seen all over the world in a very diminished form to this very day. And you may say, now you've lost it, Gary. Dragons are not seen. Yes, they are. Commonly reported all over the world. Loch La Cruz, Loch Ness, Lake Champlain, Ogopogo, Lake Ogopogo, just north of Seattle, Canadian territory. And slipping my mind, there's, yeah, thank you. There's a large lake up there, and they've got their own pet lake monster. All over the world, there are these dragons that are occasionally seen. They've been seen by ships at sea and reported on for years. And then when people try to catch them, they're always gone. But these are manifestations of the dragon. And always when the dragon is seen by ordinary people, the dragon is seen scuttling along upon its stomach, but still very fearful. Most of the time it's seen in the water, and then it disappears. Why does it disappear? Well, it's one of those creatures that's able to manifest itself periodically. It does no harm, but yet it's a reminder that a dragon in diminished form still exists. The Lord cursed the dragon back in Genesis 3 and said, oh, you're going to be crawling on your belly you're going to lose your power of flight, and I believe he has lost his power of flight in the sense that he used to have it. But there really is a dragon, and there are manifestations of dragons, and there are manifestations of dragon worship all over the world, and the dragon becomes a symbol of world power. That is, the symbol of the great powers that will come together after the church has departed from the world, and that's what's being spoken of here. The great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be devoured, for to devour her child as soon as it was delivered, as soon as it was born, it says in the English language. So this woman is, if you will, a dual purpose woman. She is Israel. And she is Mary. And the child is Israel. And the child is Jesus. And you've heard me talk about the points of comparison between Jesus and Israel. They have both gone through similar experiences down through the ages. Jesus came and was persecuted and banished. Israel came and was persecuted and banished. Israel and Jesus play separate but very, very similar roles. And the dragon wanted to devour her child as soon as it was delivered. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And of course, we know who that is. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now that would be the second half of the tribulation. Because Israel is gathered, and we're going to go into great detail about this in the very near future. 
the gatherings of Israel, there are two latter-day regatherings of Israel, clearly spoken of. The first one we are in the midst of right now. It began in 1882 when the first Jews came from Russia back to Israel. There were about 17 of them. And waves of Jews began to appear. Zionism began to be a thought in the minds of men in 1897. Fifty years later, 1947, the UN approved a covenant by which Israel could become a state, which it did in the next year, May 14, 1948. All of our lives we have seen the progressive regathering of Israel, but there is coming a banishment of Israel from the land. The woman is going to have to flee into the wilderness. And let's go back to Matthew chapter 24 and remind you of something that we have studied before. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 8, after Jesus talks about earthquakes, famines, pestilences, and so forth, he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. That is, the beginning of birth pangs. I think we're seeing that period even as we speak. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many, because iniquity, that is lawlessness, wickedness, shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Unto the end of what? The tribulation period. And salvation here is physical salvation the salvation of the nation Israel, which is on the verge of being destroyed at this time. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The gospel of the kingdom. Now, when you and I go out and preach the gospel to people, that is when you visit with people, occasionally bring the word of Christ to them in hopes that they will receive Christ, you're not preaching the gospel of the kingdom. You're preaching the gospel of the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ, the idea that his blood sacrifice is sufficient for the redemption of sinful man. That's not the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus says the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. The gospel of the kingdom is the gospel that says in the future Israel will be regathered into a kingdom, and the Lord will be seated upon the throne of David and will rule with a rod of iron, and all nations shall be subservient to him. That's the gospel of the kingdom. And so Jesus says, He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Israel has been regathered today, still being regathered. Jews are returning in record numbers to Israel right now in preparation for a massive judgment. There will come a day when all those that have been regathered will have to flee. That's verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And what are they fleeing? The abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation was predicted by Daniel the prophet when he said, this man who signs a seven-year covenant with Israel, which becomes the seven-year tribulation, is going to stand up in the holy place and commit the abomination of desolation. Kanaf hashekutzim in the Hebrew, which means a wing of horrors, translated into English as the abomination of desolation. Kanaf hashekutzim means uh, something so horrible you can't even look at it. Like a horror movie that is so horrible that you have to go out in the lobby. You know what I mean? That's what's coming to Israel. Jesus refers to it. He says, When you shall therefore see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And in the Greek, I don't know what language Jesus was speaking. He spoke, of course, fluent Greek, as did all of his peers. He spoke Latin. 
and he spoke Aramaic, and he spoke fluent Hebrew as well. But technically, he probably spoke every language on earth. But it's recorded in Greek. The abomination of desolation is called Bedilikma Tis Hermoseos. Well, that's a dirty word in Greek. I'll tell you, dirty. I mean, to translate that word into English, you've got to be very careful because that's a dirty word. It's called the abomination of desolation. That's coming. Israel is going to have to flee to a hiding place. Let's continue. There's so much here and so little time. The man-child who's to rule all nations with a rod of iron was caught up to God and to his throne, where he is today functioning as our great high priest in heaven. And the woman fled into the wilderness. That's this business about when you see this abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, get out of town. Don't pack a bag. Don't look back. Go, or you could die. And the woman does flee into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God, and she's going to stay there 1,203 score days. 1,260 days would be three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation. So the question is, where does the woman go to hide in the wilderness for three and a half years? I don't know. I mean, would God give away the hiding place? Of course not. If it's a hiding place, <laughs> you wouldn't say where it is. A lot of people say, well, it's Petra. You could say that it's Petra. I don't know. There are reasons, Old Testament reasons, for saying that. But I think that this hiding place is a real hiding place. It's a good hiding place. How many people will be hiding? I don't know. How many people are in Israel today? Well, it'd be in the millions. People are going to be running for their lives during this time. And at the very same time, the war that is going on in heaven right now, and has been for a long time, will rise to fever pitch. And at that point, there's going to come a climactic stage in the battle. Verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Now, there's going to be a great aerial battle going on here of truly sci-fi proportions. If somebody made a movie about this, nobody would believe it. It was all done by computer, I'm sure. But no, it's a real dragon fighting with Michael and the angels. Never been anything like this before, but they've been fighting for certain. Daniel talks about the fight. The prophet Isaiah talks about the fight. Second Kings talks about the aerial battle. There are a lot of places in the Bible that talk about the aerial battles that have been taking place over a period of time. And occasionally, those aerial battles peek through into our dimension. And occasionally, people see very strange things in the sky. And they wonder, what is that? Well, the Bible says that what it is is a continual raging battle between the forces of heaven and the forces of hell. But in this battle, this is the final battle where the dragon is defeated. He does not catch the little pill and regain his lost powers. He's defeated. And the great dragon was cast out, and the old serpent called the devil Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, you imagine, here you are, standing on earth, and you see this unbelievable thing going on in the heavens. Maybe lights, maybe you'll hear noises, swooshing and booming, explosions. Maybe you'll catch sight of something that looks like a flying shield, or a, maybe a fleeting, flitting human being, an actual flying man. And maybe you might catch sight of another thing that looked like some kind of a dark bat-winged creature right out of hell. You might see these things in the heavens. And then if you were in the right place, you would see this unbelievable creature that looks something like a reptile falling out of the heavens and landing flat on his face on the earth. And he would get up and dust himself off and say, what hit me? And you think, Gary, you have gone crazy now. That's your pure imagination. No, it's in the Bible. Satan's going to be cast out. He's going to fall to earth and lose his excellent disguise, 
which makes him appear as an angel of light. And he's going to be seen for what he is, which is a beast out of hell on his way to being totally destroyed. And the angels that followed him, the ones that have not been imprisoned and who are working with him right now, are going to be cast out with him. And you wouldn't want to be on earth when that happens because you got a bunch of mad angels and you got a mad Satan and you got a spiritual battle raging right on the surface of the planet, all of which takes place during the vile judgments which are upcoming. We haven't talked about those yet. To me, and I've said this so many times, the value of discussing Scripture, which is very difficult to understand, is that it stretches your imagination. Do you have the faith to believe that this is the real stuff, or do you say, oh, this is a bunch of spiritualized stories for kiddies, and you shouldn't really believe that it's actually going to happen? Well, I fall in the school of belief that says we're reading about things here that are actually going to happen. And it makes me thank my God even more that I am saved and I'm not going to go through any of that. So he's flat on the ground in the dust and he says, verse 10, John says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, strength, the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And we all know the story of Job, right? Where Satan, the accuser of the brethren, appeared at a council in heaven before God, and they began having a conversation about Job, the righteous man. And God and Satan have a discussion about him. And Satan says, if you'll let me remove Job's blessing, he'll curse you to your face. He's just a fake. He doesn't have real faith. And the Lord says, you can test him. Go ahead. Now, That's why he's called the accuser of the brethren. That's what he does. He's busy bringing charges against us before God all the time. He and his minions spend their lives doing that. And by the way, if you're anything like I am, there are a lot of charges to bring. And I wouldn't be worth a plug nickel save for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. But now the accuser of the brethren is on the ground. He's not doing any accusing anymore. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So there is, at this point, a ferocious series of battles. We've talked about some of them. Last week we spent a lot of time in Daniel, where Daniel describes the battles in some depth and detail. It won't be an easy time. It'll be a time when millions, billions actually lose their lives. There will be martyrs by the hundreds of thousands, but they will be fighting on behalf of the Lamb. And here it says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens, ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. This is the third woe. Remember the last three of the seven trumpets are called woes. Trumpet five is woe one. Trumpet six is woe two. Trumpet seven is woe three. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath. The devil literally comes down into this dimension. Right now, he can pop in and out of this dimension. He can appear and disappear. Like all of the strange paraphysical phenomena that are reported these days, UFOs and Bigfoot and Ogopogo, Champ, you know, Nessie, weird things that pop in, people see them, they pop out. They pop into this dimension, they pop out. One of these days, they won't have the ability to pop out anymore. They're going to pop in and stay here. They'll lose their power to travel back and forth through the dimensions, and they'll be stuck here, and they'll be fighting everybody that's alive on earth in that day, and you wouldn't want to be here. I guarantee it. Verse 13, when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman 
which brought forth the man-child. That's Israel. He personally persecutes Israel. I don't know how. We don't know the means or the details. We'll all see that when the time comes. I'm sure we'll be watching all this happen with great interest to see how it works out in its fine details. We know the gross truth of it, but we don't know the fine details. And to the wound were given two wings of a great eagle. We're talking about the second half of the tribulation here, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So Israel's got to get out of town. When you see the abomination of desolation, said Jesus, don't even pack a bag, run for the mountains. And they have to run and hide for 42 months until the second regathering at the end of the tribulation, or toward the end of the tribulation. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. Now, what you've got here is the woman, Israel, fleeing for her life. She's given two wings of a great eagle. What are the two wings of a great eagle? I've heard some people say that's the United States Air Force, cargo planes, etc., airliners, whatever's available at the time. I don't think that's true at all. Eagles' wings are a symbol in the Old Testament of the Lord bearing up someone unto salvation. Many times we have that metaphor used in the Old Testament. Being borne up on eagles' wings is a symbol of the Lord carrying someone to safety. And the eagle's wings are simply a metaphor. I don't think that you can say that any particular force is mentioned here. She flies into the wilderness. How does she fly into the wilderness? I don't know. Could be by actual airplanes. Flying could be fleeing. Could be the general term for fleeing in any way that's possible. But she's going to flee, and she's going to be nourished for three and a half years, time, times, and half a time, which means that she's going to be gone early in the second half of the tribulation. So the serpent casts a flood out of his mouth. The Lord said, Exodus 19.4, says to Moses, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. And how I bore you on eagles' wings to take you away from the Egyptians. That's a model. That's a type for what later happens in the Great Tribulation. Because the Great Tribulation is only a large-scale global replaying of the Exodus with its ten plagues. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run, not be weary. They shall walk, and not faint. You have eagles' wings carrying the woman away from the flood. I find that most interesting because the flood is used in the Old Testament as a curse. The Lord, speaking of the day of the Lord, through the prophets in the Old Testament, several times says or refers to the Great Tribulation as a flood. Hosea 5.10 The princes of Judah were like them that removed the bound. Therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water, says the Lord. The princes of Judah were out of bounds, that is, they broke the law. Therefore, says God, I'll pour out my wrath upon them like water. That's Hosea 5.10. And the Lord says in several places, in Isaiah and in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah, Behold, the end shall come as a flood. How that happens, where the water comes from, what's going on, we don't know the details, but we do know that the serpent is able in some way to create a flood in which he attempts to flood Israel out of existence. But the earth helps the woman. Now, I don't know of anyone that can say exactly what that means. The earth opens her mouth, swallows up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. 
I see a giant battle raging between God and the grounded Satan, in which the grounded Satan is trying everything in his power to destroy the fleeing Israel, and God contradicts, countervenes every single move that the devil makes. The dragon was enraged. The Greek word used here means insanely out of his mind mad. The dragon was wroth with the woman. He went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, fleeing Israel now has a core group of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ during the tribulation. Israel has now been converted. Israel is now, if you will, Christian because they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words, they're still keeping the law, but they are believers, which would seem like a contradiction if you read the epistles of Paul. We have no reason to keep the law anymore because we have been declared righteous in Christ, therefore we don't keep the commandments. There's no need to. And yet this group of Israelis in the latter days fleeing from the dragon and hiding out in this place that we don't really understand keep the commandments and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Way, 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 way back. Keep that place that you are right now in Revelation 12. Go back to Genesis 3. This whole thing has been a long time in coming. And I'm going back, of course, to the first prophecy. After the fall of man, after the judgment of God upon man, Genesis 3.14 says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and and her seed. Her seed, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Out of the woman came the long genetic lineage that led to the Virgin Mary, the seed of the woman, who was then impregnated by the Spirit of the Lord. And the spiritual situation that existed all that time was enmity. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Speaks of the battle between Jesus and Satan, or the serpent. And you flip back over to where we are right now. The dragon was insanely enraged at the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know what Satan knows that most human beings don't know? He knows that if he could just destroy the lineage of the Messiah, he might have a chance of winning. He could destroy the thing that has the power to kill him. And all of these millennia he has been attempting to destroy to corrupt, to modify the seed of the woman, to render it corrupt, null, and void. And he doesn't give up even after he's grounded. He's still insanely angry at the woman, and he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed, which we saw back in Genesis 3.15. He's still trying to destroy the seed of the woman. Why? Because at that point in time, the woman is not in Israel. The woman's been chased out of the land. There's no thought of the Messiah. The Messiah is not here yet. What is here is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Commercial and religious Babylon now controls the earth. Israel is now out of the land. The dragon is openly pursuing them. He tries to drown them out. He tries to destroy their seed in whatever way he can and where's the Messiah? He hasn't come yet. <laughs> it's like a serial movie. I know he's going to come. <laughs> 
He comes at the end of the book. But it's fascinating to watch how God works because you can see something of the way God thinks by tracing these narratives. And it's most fascinating and so encouraging to see that he's going to win.